I see a lot of people talking about how terrifying chaos is or how scary an invasion by the Tyranids would be. And don't get me wrong, those things are definitely scary. I love talking about chaos and bugs as much as the next guy. But in my personal opinion, we just know too much about them for them to be truly scary. For me, it's the fear of the unknown that really gets under my skin. Those creepy and obscure demons and aliens that we just don't really know that much about. And although admittedly not the most obscure, as they do have their own models in the tabletop game, the Mandrakes have always stood out to me as one of the creepiest entities in the entire franchise. There's just something truly disturbing to me about things that feed on pain and suffering. Creatures that can chase you all the way across the galaxy by utilizing shadows like a portal. Can you imagine, you're just minding your business one day and all of a sudden the temperature plummets. You start hearing a bunch of creepy ghostly whispers, the lights start going out one by one, and the last thing you see is one of these scary mother literally crawling out of your own shadow. I'm gonna be honest, I don't think that's something I'd be able to handle. But what exactly are the Mandrakes? Where do they come from? And what is it that they want? Are they some bizarre evolutionary offshoot of the Eldari, demons from the realm of shadow, or something else entirely? And what's with the twisted and dark city they call home? What's that place all about? Trying to piece together their lore is admittedly rather difficult, as most of the sources that exist don't really give us a lot to go off of. But thankfully, a user by the name of Persimek over on Reddit reached out to me and had compiled a massive and thorough iceberg of every reference they were able to find on these things. So big thank you to them for letting me use their source list, and I've included a link to it in the description of this video if you want to check it out for yourself. Not only that, but the new Kill Team set, Nightmare, gave us a lot more insight into their nature, as well as several different types of mandrakes, including one that has the ability to not only become one with the shadows, but literally concentrate them to such an extreme that they can use it like a singularity of a black hole to burrow through reality. Now we're gonna get into all that and a whole lot more in this video, but before we dive headfirst into the grimdark, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Into the AM, makers of some of the best graphic tees you can get on the internet. The designs are loud, colorful, super stylish, also shrink and fade resistant, and they're some of the comfiest shirts that I own. Now personally, my favorite thing about them is that they're about 20% longer than a normal t-shirt, so they're perfect for everyone, whether you're big, tall, or uh, just kind of regular shaped. Not only does Into the AM make some of the best graphic tees that you can get, but they're now making some of the most comfy and stylish pants as well. They sent me a couple pairs of their all day pants to try out, and I gotta say, I'm wicked impressed with these things. And I promise you, that means a lot coming from me, as I live in Florida and half the year it's insufferably hot. So normally I'm a shorts, t-shirt, and flip-flops kind of guy. But I gotta say, these all day pants are now the MVP of my wardrobe. They're perfect for literally anything I've got planned, whether that's working all day making videos, going out on the town, or just hanging out with the boys down at my local game store. They're super comfy, stylish, blend in with any environment, and they're made from this awesome lightweight four-way stretch material that moves with you, so you can stay comfy all day long. They also fit true to size and have this stretchy waistband, which I'm not ashamed to admit it, as a bigger guy, I'm a big fan of. If you want to upgrade your wardrobe, then head on over to IntoTheAM.com using my link in the description or coupon code WESHAMMER at checkout to save 10% off your entire order. Again, head on over to IntoTheAM.com using my link in the description or use coupon code WESHAMMER at checkout to save 10% off your entire order. Big thanks to IntoTheAM for sponsoring this video. It's no secret that the galaxy of the 41st millennium is full of unimaginable horrors. Yet, out of all its terrors, no faction is more rightfully feared by both human and alien cultures alike than the Drukhari, a sadistic and cruel race of psychic vampires that have evolved to feed on the pain and suffering of others. They are a faction of pirates and murderers, torturers and slavers, sculptors of despair and artisans of agony that know nothing of empathy or mercy. However, despite their fearsome reputation, there is another species they harbor a primordial fear of. Within the confines of Kimora, the home city of the Drukhari, whispers slither through shadowy corridors and across bloodstained arenas of beings comprised entirely of darkness, shadowy assassins that dwell in the space between reality, emerging from the very shadows to drag their prey kicking and screaming back into the void. Over the millennia, these creatures have gone by many names, from wraiths to ghouls, geists or skitterlings, 
but the Imperium of the 41st Millennium knows them simply as Mandrakes. These Xenos abominations are said to be dread incarnate and fear made manifest. Much like the Drukhari, they have evolved to feed on suffering and their lethal skills for death dealing are matched only by their infinite capacity for cruelty. They are able to strike anywhere in the galaxy at any time, leaving behind blood-drenched alleyways and horrendous spectacles of ritualistic gore designed to spread fear through the enemy ranks or a human settlement. They view humanity as nothing more than a food source, one who is best harvested only after having been sufficiently marinated in terror. No one really knows what the Mandrakes are, but there are a lot of theories. Some say they are the result of ancient prefall Eldari copulating with demons, whereas others say that they are a forbidden cult that survived the collapse of their empire by escaping into the realm of shadows. Others still claim that they are our own reflection, our primordial fears given form that crawl out of the mirror dimension to feast upon their creators. There are even theories that state that the Mandrakes are demons of shadow, and their home dimension of Alendrak is the Chaos Realm of Darkness. The higher-ups within the Imperium are well aware of the existence of the Mandrakes, and the Ordo Xenos of the Inquisition has gone to great lengths to study and combat their threat, while simultaneously keeping all information pertaining to their existence out of the hands of the general public. Yet, despite the Inquisition's best efforts, the Mandrake's long and bloody history is impossible to truly cover up. To the average civilian, the Mandrake is something of a boogeyman, a creature of myth and legend, whose stories have spread both from fragments of after-action reports that have ended up leaking through faulty channels and the mouths of shaking, terrified survivors who claim to have been attacked by living shadows. These tales at first emerge as ghoulish gossip in underhive communities that end up spreading from system to system along trade routes before becoming cemented as local folklore. They are figures of dark fairy tales, a cautionary warning that man should always remain fearful of the darkness and that which lurks within it. Those who have survived attacks by the Mandrakes and lived long enough to give their report describe their appearance as mercurial, constantly shifting unpredictably like moonlight passing through moving clouds. In one moment, their face may be mostly featureless, resembling something like an age-worn statue, only to then suddenly transform as fiery red or green eyes burst to life above a mouth that splits apart from ear to ear like a grotesque wound, displaying a mocking smile of pearlescent, needle-sharp teeth. Their skin is often adorned with luminous runic symbols comprised of an eldritch language known only to the mandrakes themselves. Although many foolish individuals have tried to decipher these symbols in the past, all have ended up cursed or left maddened by the attempt. To the disciplined fighting forces of the Imperium, the Mandrakes are feared as apex assassins, their evolutionary path having blessed them with supernatural reflexes, agility, and reaction times, as well as the grotesque ability to manipulate their anatomy, contorting their limbs and bodies into impossible shapes in order to squeeze through the tiniest of cracks or down the smallest of holes. They've even been documented scaling sheer surfaces in defiance of gravity or scuttling across ceilings like deranged spiders without the use of any kind of climbing equipment. It's as if the laws that govern our universe are merely a suggestion to the Mandrakes. However, their acrobatic abilities pale in comparison to the gift that they are most infamous for. You see, Mandrakes can utilize darkness and shadows like a doorway, a portal into another dimension, wherein they can immediately and effortlessly travel incomprehensible distances in the blink of an eye before re-emerging in another pool of darkness. Whether they utilize this to track prey from world to world, or in combat to seemingly vanish into thin air, only to instantaneously emerge, attacking from a different direction. Mandrakes are patient hunters and can spend days, weeks, months, or even years stalking their prey, moving from shadow to shadow, watching their every movement. But sometimes, Mandrakes will never truly reveal themselves, instead silently moving about a city, feasting on the suffering of a local population from the shadows. When they do choose to strike, however, there are a few warning signs an individual can watch for. Sometimes, their manifestation is preceded by a soul-chilling clicking sound, a guttural croaking that is believed to be their equivalent to laughter, every click seeming to echo from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Other times, their arrival may be preceded by a sudden intense drop in temperature, a rim of dark frost spreading across every surface in the immediate area. 
Candlelight will sputter and die, as overhead lumens flicker and burst one by one, plunging the area into complete darkness. Those with particularly acute senses may also experience a growing feeling of directionless panic or an oppressive paranoia, leaving them wide-eyed and gasping for air, their heart thundering in their chest as they frantically search for the origin of their terror, only to eventually spot a shadowy apparition rising from their comrade's shadow with a glimmer steel blade held high, ready for a decapitating strike. Under normal circumstances, the Mandrakes leave very few, if any, survivors, although they have been known to take living victims in the past. Now, whatever dark fate awaits these damned individuals that are dragged kicking and screaming through the shadows back to Alendrak remains a mystery to even the Inquisition. And on the nature of their origin, although it's true that no one, even the Eldari themselves, truly know or remember what the Mandrakes are, the Imperium has categorized them as a Xenos life form, an evolutionary offshoot of the Eldar. Now, that being said, we do know that they are not demons as they're not born of the warp, but this fact can in turn be kind of misleading, as they honestly have more in common with demons than any living creature within the physical universe. First, much like demons, the Mandrake's form is not entirely corporeal. It is said that they exist in two realms simultaneously, one foot in the realm of the physical and the other always within the shadowy dimension they call home, meaning that in combat, they are incredibly difficult to deal with as bolter fire and blade strikes will often pass through their bodies harmlessly like a knife through smoke. Additionally, as was demonstrated in the novel The Oubliette, there are profane rituals that exist that can be used to summon mandrakes, much like demons. And normally, this takes the form of making a sacrifice of flesh upon an altar or diagram of ritual significance in order to open a portal to Alendrak. Although references to Mandrake society and technology are pretty rare within 40k's lore, it is evident that they do have their own form of society within Alendrak, and they also utilize their own form of bizarre alien technology. For the most part, though, they use very little in the way of combat equipment the way we would understand it. In battle, they traditionally wear a garb of human skin taken from their victims, and instead of more traditional ranged and melee weapons utilized by other factions, they often only wield swords, knives, and sickles carved from either the bones of those they have murdered or an alien substance known as glimmer steel. A very rare few even carry strange relics and fetishes that through some heretical means are able to deflect or nullify all but the most grievous of attacks. In addition to their melee weapons, they're also able to harness the terrifying essence of the eldritch runes that shift across their body to produce lethal flaming projectiles formed from the essence of Elendrak itself. These flames are powerful enough to not only burn through armor, flesh, and bone, but even down into the victim's very soul. Although one could be forgiven for simply looking at them and thinking that they're a unit that's able to throw around fireballs, it gets a little bit more complicated than that, as these flames are not three-dimensional attacks that travel through physical space, but something far more sinister. They are instead propelled across the bonds of emotion that stretch across the underlying fabric of the universe. There's been documented cases where an individual struck by a Mandrake's balefire will not only burst into flames, but also people on the other side of the galaxy that the victims shared a bond of love, hatred, or merely contemplated at the moment they were struck will also find themselves engulfed in the same chilling inferno. As Mandrakes are most commonly observed fighting alongside the Drukhari raiding parties, most people assume them to feel something of a kinship with their Dark Eldar cousins. But this honestly couldn't be further from the truth. Mandrakes fight only for those who know the esoteric means by which to contact them and form a contract. They feel no sense of loyalty to anyone but themselves and are in a very rudimentary sense assassins for hire. How a person comes to learn about the Mandrake's existence, or more specifically how to actually make contact with them, is always different. The Mandrakes themselves may sense their bloodthirsty intent and whisper forbidden words of summoning through darkened mirrors, pools of blood, or any other dark reflective surface. Once the individual makes contact, the Mandrakes will give them a price for their services, and most of the time involving strange and esoteric forms of payment as they care nothing for conventional wealth. Their demands may take the form of living captives, but traditionally, it is something that is far more difficult to obtain or even make sense of. Noted forms of Mandrake payment are the summoner's most treasured memory, a true secret name, a heartbeat, a treasured hope, or a hidden loathing. They don't care how the summoner goes about obtaining said payment, only that it is delivered in full. Most of the time in 40k's lore, when Mandrakes appear, they fight in complete silence. Any communication that occurs happens on a wavelength that we are incapable of perceiving in a language known only to them. 
However, it has been shown on several occasions that when they choose to, the mandrakes are capable of communicating with other species, regardless of any form of language barrier through supernatural methods. Whether this take the form of scratching runic symbols into a mirror surface that only the individual the message was meant for is capable of interpreting, or by speaking directly into the individual's mind. The whispered words of a mandrake are always riddles wrapped in an enigma, designed to deliberately trick or entrap those who would seek them out into a contract they have no hope of actually fulfilling. The individual agreeing to terms they do not fully understand and thus damning themselves in the process. However, from the mandrake's perspective, ignorance of what the payment actually entails is no excuse for failing to deliver, and trying to cheat them is perhaps the most foolish thing a person can do, even more foolish than entering into the contract in the first place. No matter who you are, no matter how much power you wield, how many armies you command, or how far removed you think you may be from the mandrakes, if you don't follow through on payment, nothing will keep you safe. They will hunt you until the end of time, from one edge of the galaxy to another, and the best case scenario for you is that you simply buy yourself some time, but ultimately, you're just delaying the inevitable. There is nowhere in the physical universe that is completely purged of shadows or darkness, and likewise, there is nowhere the mandrakes cannot follow you to. And when they do finally catch you, which they will, the mandrakes show no mercy to debtors. In fact, hunting down those who owe them a debt is a sport they seem to enjoy more than anything else. They love every aspect of the hunt, and in particular, truly delight in drawing it out as long as possible, savoring the creeping sensation of dread and the building of terror on those idiotic few that thought they could get one over on them. They enjoy it so much, in fact, that it stands to reason that oftentimes they may have never expected their contractor to be able to pay their tithe in the first place. Regardless of the sinister nature of the deal or just how damned their summoner may or may not be, to the Mandrake's credit, they always follow through on their word and are ideally suited for missions that fully utilize their insidious talents, whether that be launching campaigns of terror behind enemy lines, slipping into the most heavily fortified of locations to sabotage vital systems, or assassinate marked individuals. To the Mandrakes, no area is off limits, no location unreachable, and no fortress impenetrable. There are reports of ruling figures being locked away in protective panic rooms deep under a planet's surface and guarded by the world's most elite warriors, but after the fighting has calmed down and their generals go to let them out, they end up encountering a hellish display of gore. Entrails spread wide across the room, and the body of the deceased often arranged with care to look as if it is knelt in silent prayer to its own remains. There have been tales of mandrakes suddenly materializing inside of the cockpits of knights, aircrafts, void ships, or even Imperial Titans, eviscerating their pilots and supporting crew before disappearing into the shadows from which they emerged. In addition to operating as legendary assassins and saboteurs, the Mandrakes also make for terrifying sentinels and bodyguards. An Archon of the Drukhari may have them exist in the shadows wherever they go, feigning an air of helplessness for any that would dare betray them, only for their would-be murderers to find themselves skewered upon the end of multiple glimmer steel blades the moment they make their presence known. Other times, the Mandrakes have been employed to abduct key personnel alive, slipping behind enemy lines, grabbing individuals that have information valued by their contractors, or even the summoner's own allies who are in need of rescuing. The only problem here is that the trip back through the shadowy dimension that the Mandrakes take these individuals on can often drive them into madness, as they bear witness to things that no mortal mind was designed to comprehend. Mandrakes do not always operate alone, and sometimes will pursue prey in small groups in a highly ritualized fashion that defies logic, the esoteric rules they follow known only to them. Sometimes they will pursue prey only at specific hours of the day or night, or when their victim's heart beats to a certain rhythm. Although difficult to ascertain, if their prey is able to figure out their methods, they may be able to postpone their doom. Although most of the time, when we talk about mandrakes or see them show up in the stories, they have entered into some form of contract and are acting under the orders of another. But this is not always the case. Oftentimes, mandrakes set out into real space of their own accord to pursue their own objectives. There have been tales of Xenos archaeologists who got too close to an ancient ritual site or unearthed a seemingly innocuous summoning instrument such as a shard of dark glass or an alien obelisk. No matter the circumstances that drew the mandrakes' attention in the first place, once they leave Alendrak, it is said that they never return empty-handed. 
And as we've mentioned Alendrak several times throughout this video, I think it's important that we take a minute to dive deeper into the dimension of darkness the Mandrakes call home. So first, a little background information. All of the Dark Eldar, the Mandrakes included, come from a single city known as Kimora that exists deep within the Webway, a parallel dimension comprised of seemingly infinite arrays of tunnels and corridors that stretch across the galaxy. Now, this is true, but when we say that they all come from a single city, it kind of paints a dishonest picture of the Dark Eldar as a faction especially in terms of size and scope. Kimura is no more a single city than it is a single place. It is at the same time tiny and mundane while also being infinite in scale and complexity. To call it a city kinda honestly does it a disservice, as it's more of a series of pocket realities and overlapping dimensions that have all been absorbed into its labyrinthian fabric. Kimura consists of countless sub-realms, such as Shah Dom, Iron Thorn, the Sable Marches, Malixian's Averies, and a thousand more, each existing around a multi-dimensional corner from one another. The official analogy from the Dark Eldar Codex states that in metaphysical terms, the sub-realms of Kimura exist behind a door, through an arch, beyond a looking glass, or in the case of the aforementioned Alendrak, within the darkest of shadows. And I know I say this in my videos a lot, but this is true in both a figurative and a literal sense. This video isn't necessarily about the multi-dimensional nature of Kimura, but if you want a really good example of this, then check out the novel Silent Hunters, wherein a Karkaradon kill team that is attempting to travel to the Dark City ends up going through a seemingly innocuous door on their ship that takes them into a dimension of infinite doors wherein they must find the one true door that leads to Kimura. But thankfully, they have with them the ultimate weapon, a neurodivergent child that has a hyperfixation on doors. And no, I'm not making that up. It's very trippy stuff. Kimura itself, and all of the pathways that lead to it, kinda remind me of Alice in Wonderland. If, you know, Wonderland was full of sadomasochistic BDSM elves that are obsessed with torture and huffing, snorting, and injecting the most ludicrous drugs imaginable. Anyways, although it would not be remotely accurate to call any single realm within Kimura normal, Alendrak is by far the strangest. It is Kimura's dark reflection, a realm of perpetual darkness and a dimension made of writhing, living shadows. The realm itself is said to be alive and sentient and is capable of expanding its borders at will. It is not simply a place one can visit or leave whenever they like. There is no roadmap to Alendrak, no signpost that points you in its direction. The only way somebody can enter this place is if they have business here or the realm itself permits you entry, whether by guiding the traveler into its clutches or by coming to them directly. If you were to find yourself suddenly in Alendrak, you would at first see nothing. The darkness is so all-consuming that it's impossible to tell if your eyes are open or shut. To be able to make sense of anything here, one must accept that the physical laws of the universe no longer apply. They must abandon the senses they have relied upon to guide them through life and instead embrace their sense of self. This is a quick passage from the Path of the Archon where an individual is explaining what it's like to be an Alendrak. Here, sight, sound, and indeed all of the other senses become co-mingled, the master's voice continued, perhaps in the same way that light becomes one with its absence in this environment. Substance is a more tenuous proposition here, for bereft of our usual visual and tactile certainties, it becomes difficult to decide what is and is not real in an environment where either is very much possible. Will is a more important attribute than perceptions of physical solidity under such circumstances. I live, I breathe, I am real. I exist here because it is my desire to do so. By my self-belief, I am not absorbed into the shadow even as I become one with it in order to exist in this realm. Do you understand? It may be the death of you if you don't. On one hand, Alendract is a subdistrict of Kimora, and on the other, it's its own distinct entity. When the Mandrakes accompany the Dark Eldar in their raids, the Drukhari will frequently refer to them as their Alendraki allies, not their fellow Kimoran citizens. It's a subtle distinction, but one that's incredibly important. Likewise, the Mandrakes do not consider themselves part of Dark Eldar society, and the two realms quite frequently don't see eye to eye. In fact, the Mandrakes and the Dark Eldar kinda hate each other and are most of the time just allies of convenience. 
On many occasions, the shadowy realms of Alendrak have sought to expand, its darkness spilling out into the rest of Kimura in an attempt to take it over, its boundaries undulating and shifting in a constant attempt to absorb more territories into its suffocating darkness. It honestly seems to function in a pretty similar manner to how the realms of the Chaos Gods shrink and expand to encompass more or less territory depending on their associated deity's current standing within the hierarchy. The only thing keeping it from taking over the entirety of the webway is the rest of Kimura and its defenders, who keep a watchful eye on their city's shadow for signs of an expansion effort. We honestly get to see a pretty good example of this happening in the Path of the Archon book, wherein Kimura is currently suffering the effects of a demonic incursion, and with the city's back turned and its defenders preoccupied, Alendrak and the Mandrakes make their move, launching an invasion of their own. Without going into too much detail, Asdrubale Vect ends up stopping both of these invading forces by tricking both sides into thinking that he had been slain in battle. His allies broke, fleeing for their lives, while all of the demons and the mandrakes gathered near his corpse in triumph, all of his enemies gathering in the same spot. This was exactly what he wanted, and from the safety of his spire in an event that would later come to be known as the Gaze of Vect, he utilized an ancient forbidden weapon to hurl a captured star at them. This event instantly vaporized the vast majority of the attackers and sent the few smart enough to flee before it was too late back into the shadows of Alendrak to recover from burn wounds that would never fully heal. There hasn't been another takeover attempt at this scale by Alendrak and the Mandrake since that day, but it's a foregone conclusion that it will eventually happen again. Okay, so now that we know a bit more about what the Mandrakes are and where they come from, let's talk a bit more about their specific different unit types. Now, Mandrakes have little in common with formalized militaries, and it is often difficult to make sense of their unit structures or formal hierarchy. For the most part, they all wear the same uniforms made of the flayed skin they take from their victims, and all efforts to derive any form of meaning from the glyphs on their skin has come up empty-handed. However, in observing Mandrakes on the field of battle, the Imperium has been able to recognize individuals that we could consider specialists. And we actually got a better look at these specialists in the Nightmare Kill Team set. Now, from this source, we're able to derive five different types of Mandrakes in addition to the standard warriors. These are the Night Fiends, the Abyssals, the Chooser of Flesh, the Dirge Maw, and the Shadow Weavers. The creatures known as Night Fiends are the closest equivalent the Mandrakes have to a squad captain, and they have two things that make them stand out as unique. The first is a particularly terrifying aura that floods the mind of any in their vicinity with a disturbing cacophony of ghostly whispers. These disembodied voices instill a paralyzing sensation of dread in all those that hear them, rendering them incapable of fighting back. If someone is capable of overcoming this aura, when they go to attack, they may find any wounds they manage to inflict on the Mandrake instantly negated. This is due to a particularly macabre relic that each of the Night Fiends is in possession of, known as an Oubliex. These relics traditionally take the form of a fetish made from bone, skin, or pieces of dried flesh taken from the Night Fiend's victims. They act as a ghostly jail that imprisons all of the Night Fiend's victims' souls. Attacks against the wielder of this relic will pass through them like a bullet through smoke, and then the wound that should have been suffered will instead be transferred to the ghostly prisoners. While it is true that all Mandrakes maintain a connection to Alendrak, this is after all how they utilize the shadows to move around, the ones classified as Abyssals are said to have a much stronger connection, as they have never actually fully stepped out of the realm of shadows, thus they act as a conduit for its malign energies. Because of this, the Balefire they conjure is far more powerful and versatile than the flames utilized by other Mandrakes. You can kind of think of them as a Mandrake heavy weapons team, as their flames are able to be fired at a faster rate over a longer distance with a more devastating impact. The connection they maintain with their shadowy home acts in much the same way that power cables or ammo feeds work on heavy guns wielded by a Space Marine Devastator squad, both being used to link the user's ranged weapon to a surplus power reservoir. Now, the Chooser of Flesh, on the other hand, is a Mandrake specialist that utilizes a two-hand variant of Glimmer Steel Blades, and making them into a much more devastating melee combatant. Their name is derived from the fact that in battle, they have this strange proclivity for severing their victims' limbs and then claiming them for ritualistic purposes. Now, the purpose of this behavior, unfortunately, is still unknown. The Mandrakes known as Dirge Maws are ambush specialists that are able to manipulate their opponent into seeing their reflection wherever they look, disorienting the victim and causing them to impotently lash out at the shadows. When it moves in for the kill, it unleashes a wailing scream that sheds the victim's sanity and ruptures their soul. 
Although all mandrakes are referred to as masters of shadow, as they're all able to slip in and out of them at will, they are always withholden also to the light, as shadows cannot exist without it. That's where the shade weavers come in, as they're not just in tune with the darkness, but it's very architect, and are able to absorb and destroy both artificial and natural light through supernatural means. They wield the very essence of shadow itself, and are capable of plunging even the most well-lit of areas into a suffocating darkness so impenetrable that not even the most advanced sensors utilized by the Imperium can pierce it. By twisting the penumbral threads of their weave, they can deepen the darkness even further, until it becomes so concentrated that it bores a tunnel through reality itself. Although the mechanics of how mandrakes are capable of slipping in and out of the shadows is unknown, it stands to reason that it requires some form of energy or an unknown resource. With the Shade Weaver's tunnels, however, mandrakes are capable of effortlessly traveling between two points free of charge, making them essential for larger or more drawn out engagements. In Warhammer 40k, the Mandrakes serve the purpose of not only being a lethal predator that prowls the dark corners of the galaxy, but they also exist as harbingers of a deeper, more existential dread. They are the embodiment of darkness itself, a mirror held up to the dark desires and fears of every living soul. Their ability to strike anywhere at any time, for reasons known only to them, is a reminder of the inescapable certainty of death and despair commonplace in the grim dark future. To me, they represent the fear of the unknown, as despite their long and bloody history, we still know very little about them or the shadowy dimension they hail from. And although I hope in the future we get a deeper look into Alendrak and the other horrors that are said to linger there, perhaps it is best for humanity that certain doors are left unopened. As the stars themselves begin to dim and cast long shadows across the Imperium's million worlds, the legend of the Mandrake endures. They are the true horrors that lurk just beyond the veil of reality, that will never let mankind forget that sometimes death is a mercy, as there are far more horrifying fates that can await those who seek answers to forbidden questions. But what do you think of all this? What do you think the Mandrakes actually are? Are they half Eldar, half demon? Or are they full-blown demons of shadow that have somehow been able to exist outside of the warp? I've always thought these guys were really cool, and I was super happy to see that we were getting a little bit more insight into them with the release of their new Kill Team set. And I hope Games Workshop continues down that path. Considering that they've said in the past that Alendrak is full of horrifying entities that we've yet to be introduced to, do you think it's possible that they could split the Mandrakes off into their own army? If so, what kind of units would they have? What other terrifying creatures do you think live in Alendrak? Let me know all of your thoughts, comments, concerns, or corrections down in the comments section below. And don't forget to tell me what other parts of 40k's lore you'd love to hear me talk about, as I'm always looking for new ideas or just fun stuff to read about. I'll also give you a quick update on my situation. I still haven't found a new studio to record in, but I did make a spare recording room in one of my spare bedrooms. So sounds going to be a little weird for a little while as I still kind of figure that out. And I appreciate y'all being patient with me as I navigate through this weird middle chapter. Anyways, big thanks to everyone who supports the work that I do, and I'll catch y'all in the next one.